started. Uh, my name's Mike Schertz with Crisis Medicine. Thank you everyone from co for coming. I would say good morning because it's morning here still in Portland, but uh, I know we have a, a fairly international audience. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to facilitate JJ's presentation on as an experience uh, dealing with some chemical warfare agent casualties in Syria. This presentation was initially, uh, I guess, given in an abbreviated for portion at the Special Operations Medical Association meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it got bumped a little bit because of a Ukrainian speaker, which was understandable and reasonable. So we're very happy to have been able to give him the chance to, uh, to put this out. Our plan here is that he will give his presentation uh, I'll talk a little bit about mustard agents in some, I guess, kind of medical scientific detail uh, relevant to what he's talking about. And then um, Sean will speak extemporaneously on everything, which is what he does best. A couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this and hopefully in a day or two, we'll get it edited, cleaned up and posted for free. Uh, so if you want to see it again, or you pass along to your friends that you saw this amazing, amazing presentation with these two ruggedly handsome former SF dudes and Sean McKay, uh, they'll be able to have access to that. The chat is being monitored. We're going to try to stay off of that um, as panelists. And then if you have a question, put it in the chat but I'm told you can upvote the question and then we'll start with the most popular, hopefully salient questions uh, first and then we'll answer questions until essentially we run out of time. So that's how this is going to flow. Uh, John is a recently retired Special Forces medic. Again, he's gonna talk about his experience in Syria um, in 2016 doing medical support for a special mission unit. Sean, I think, uh, doesn't need much of an introduction of element rescue. Uh, he is a technical rescue savant, in my opinion, uh, and speaks and helps organizations plan for um, operating in unknown and unknowable environments, which I think is an oxymoron. Um, my background, I'm a former 18 Delta as well. Uh, I'm an emergency physician, EMS physician with a bit of experience in the tactical medical realm. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good night, I guess. It just depends on where you're at. Um, you know, we all know that, like, obviously, I am terrible when it comes to time, um, so in time zones specifically. But like, as Mike said, I'm John Johnson. For those of you who don't know, I guess now you know. Um, so, well, apparently, we're going to go ahead and just automatically jump into this thing. All right, so real quick, um, it's it's all um, as far as disclaimers and such, I'm retired, um, I'm jobless, not homeless yet, but I look like one. Um, so um, I don't need anything to disclaim. Uh, everything here that it's spoken about is not classified, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so it is going to be a deep conversation. Um, there's a lot of salient points that need to be hit. Um, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can, um, as fast as I can, uh, but just keep in mind, like if you hear something, I say something that you don't know about, please ask questions. We'll get to as fast as we can, or we'll answer it later um, in an ADHD um, infused evening of not sleeping. Don't worry, I promise we'll get to you eventually. Um, you are a priority, not always the priority. Um, you'll hear that a lot, right? So here we go, um, the fallout of CBR and exposure, right? A cosmology episode, not a cosmetology episode. Uh, I do need one of those to have my beard look like Sean's, uh, but we'll get there eventually. Um, it'll slowly grow, right? So let's take a look at this. All right, if I can get this. There we go, awesome. So first things first, let's think about the environment that, that we all operate in. Um, if you're not a typist or somebody who's an expert at Excel, you work in probably the same environment uh, we do, and otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, right? So what is that? That's a VUCA T-squared environment. I think it's just important to go ahead and cover that a little bit just briefly before we get in here, because um, I think that oftentimes we just kind of ignore the complexity and the toughness of the environment that we work in. All right, um, so that is volatile, 
uncertain, complex, ambiguous, threat containing and emerging, right? And then time constrained, right? So these are all things that we have to deal with at all times. It's a very complex environment and that is, that is key to experiencing and understanding uh, the scenario that we're about to talk about. So um, if you have a question about any of these, obviously you can Google it, right? Or you can ask us, um, but I feel like it should be relatively forthright. Um, that being said, let's go to the next slide, right? So to kind of put this all into context, let me stop staring at myself so I can see everything else. Um, here I am, Northern Syria, 2016, right? So who is it? It's me and one other guy, um, another team guy, I'm not gonna say who, um, but non-medic, right? What is it? Well, it's a CCP, um, the keyword ought to be the, the control in that, right? So that's the casualty um, control point, not necessarily even a collection point. I think that's sometimes uh, missed uh, more than it should be, right? When, 2016, where, Northern Syria, that's all I really wor need to worry about, right? Why? Um, well, honestly, because I got suckered. Is really, and I was at the right guy at the right time or the wrong guy at the wrong time, however you want to look at it. Um, uh, definitely the right guy for Ryan so that he could continue to do what he wanted to do, right? And how? Um, well, in the beginning, honestly, poorly, right? But to kind of go back to the Vuka T squared concept, right? It was uncertain in a lot of ways. I was, I had just gotten to the country literally less than 36 hours ago, and I was asked to go ahead and run um, a CCP. I was told, hey, you know what, like two, three days tops. And good news, we've done this before. Um, that's some words that I probably should have keyed up on, right? And we're not gonna be there long and nobody ever comes anyway. But at, at worst or at best, like three patients, at absolute worst, 40 patients. Um, I think it's important to gonna go ahead and take a quick um, breather there and say, at that time, 40 patients in a matter of, three to like, even though we're saying an extreme, a week to two weeks um, was the most I'd ever heard anybody handle um, in all of my experience in GWAT. And I've done two decades um, as a special operations medic. So I, even that was, I think just a shocker, but it was like, okay, cool. I could handle that if I had to. Um, but if you take a look over here on the right, you can see that quite quickly um, things got out of hand like almost instantaneously, right? So what you see on the far right-hand side here, uh, if you can see my mouse there, um, is these are photos of this whiteboard as it started to kind of get um, filled with, with information. And you can see day three, look, we're on 43, you know, 44, all the way down to 59. Uh, eventually it cuts off, you can't really see it, but um, like 59 patients there in day three. So we already, in day three, already, went past what I was promised um, was gonna be the absolute max. Um, and then day five, we're looking at, you know, in the 200s, day six, we're at 210. Um, and the, the hits just keep coming, um, Casey Kasem style, right? And you can see, I, I did what I could as far as getting everything established, but I didn't have a lot of equipment. Um, you're looking at, you know, pretty small room. You can see the four litters there. I had two litter stands, that's it. I am really proud of my awesome zip line. Um, this little 550 cord here and a few um, knots that are probably um, not properly tied, but you know, that's pretty Sean time. So I think it counts. Um, but that, that zip line that was there because I was losing equipment, right? Um, and again, I didn't have a lot. So um, it was definitely an issue that we started noticing as I needed things to kind of stay with me. Um, and not disappear because I didn't know, again, other uncertainties and ambiguousness is like, when is my supply chain coming? How many more people are coming? Because I, I, I've i already maxed out well past what I was promised. Um, but I did some of the normal things. You look at here, you've got a door. That, that's the one way in, one way out kind of thing. There is a back door um, to get things out if we need to. And um, if I have the unfortunate event of having a patient um, decease, then I can at least kind of take care of that. Um, in other interesting facts, so that on the right-hand side there, that's the door that goes into the living quarters for all of us and a handful of other people that would visit, right? So that comes into play later on. Um, 
these when it came into play for a whole different work reasoning. Um, you can see all these windows. So those windows don't have glass in them anymore. Um, and I learned that when the helicopter filled and made um, sugar cookies out of me and all of my patients at one point in time. So other lessons learned for a whole different kind of scenario, right? Um, but bottom line is like very overwhelming, lots of things going on, lots of big details um, that make this a, a difficult scenario just to even try to cover for this, let alone all the other events we're gonna talk about here soon. Um, but there I am alone and unafraid. What I mean by that is I'm the sole medical provider. Um, I'm the only guy who speaks Arabic. Almost nobody there speaks English, right? Um, my, my patient triage system is already a little bit different than I'm used to uh, from normal GWAT or even normal schoolhouse because it's very resource poor. Um, and so the triage comes into concepts of equipment, patient injuries, um, next, next possible care is another factor um, because where are they going? They're not going to my hospitals like we do in GWAT, they're going to their own um, and can they even handle those and how overfilled are those guys? Um, so there's just a whole bunch of other things that are there. And the design of this is for me to continue to move and follow the flot or the forward line of troops um, as we go, right? So that's already established just to, so you can kind of get yourself in my head, if you will, which is scary. I don't think you really want to do that for too long, but um, for the purpose of the next 30 minutes, welcome to it, right? So then we go and we get on to phase two. Um, and so for those of you from the 90s, if you feel like you just got shot into a hip hop video, you kind of did. Um, I blame Sean for his skills. But at phase two of this, right? So let me kind of give you uh, another who, what, where, right? So who, still me, lots of new eager helpers, but they're not skilled. Um, uh, most of them don't speak my language, but they really want to help. And um, what lots more um, casualty, a lot less control. Like we're hitting it like 800 patients at this point. We're at day 20-ish, if my memory's right. Um, where same same bat place, um, same bat time, right? Why? Well, because I'm I'm stuck. Like Ryan's not going to do this. He's got other things to do. Um, and this is kind of my gig now. Um, I I do have a happy place. You see in the far right there where I drink my cappuccino and I just recalibrate pretty much every day. And that becomes really important um, to deal with a lot of these issues that that we come up with um, as we go. So so with that, what I want to kind of keep in mind is trauma has been all we've dealt with for the most part over and over again until we get to this phase where my success begets more work. Um, it's kind of the, a thing that happens to me a lot in life. Um, Though few things that I'm good at, I'm good enough to get more people to make me want to do it more. Um, so the word gets out that I'm doing it. And now it's not just trauma patients. So all these numbers I'm giving you have been trauma patients but now it's all the different, you, who knows what patients, right? So people that, are, that have cholera, people who just have a cold, somebody has a flu, somebody has allergies, um, somebody like needs their teeth pulled, doesn't matter, they're all coming here. Cause it's, it's again, it's Syria. Um, there's this thing called a revolution. I don't know if you guys heard of it, uh, but it happened and it happened like five years before we got there. Um, so there weren't a lot of hospitals, a lot of people getting taken care of. Um, uh, to include birthing babies, um, I, I, I tell this as a joke, but it's serious. Uh, you know, there is a another little John out there in Syria. Um, it's not mine, but she was so excited that it was a boy. She really needed to know like what my name was, and she named it um, after me. Uh, that was a fun. How do I explain this to my wife? Situation, but it worked out pretty well. But I say that to say like, like there's just a lot going on, and what I wasn't ready for and what didn't really happen is you don't get trained quite to receive this in most training, right? So, and I'm not trying to make this a mass cal or a CCP conversation, but I think it's important to know the environment that all of this happened in, because when we teach CVRN, um, I feel like oftentimes we're teaching it, learning it, thinking it like it's going to be something that's announced, right? Or that it's a lot easier and obvious. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes it's not. Here's something I 
didn't even think about until I started making this presentation, it's not even legal. Um, and so myself and like, I don't know, a handful of other people tend to announce before they're about to go break the law, the rest of us just break the law. So um, you gotta think about that too, and kind of the environment you're dealing with. Um, other, other salient pieces at this point, I've hit kind of a groove and I'm starting to kind of feel like a little bit more confident, but as you can see, things like supply are getting out of control for me. S controlling systems, because I'm the only medical provider, I'm the only guy who knows what these are, like an IV kit, sure, I can probably usually tell somebody where to put that, and they know what it, that is, but a lot of the other equipment um, is just spread out across the board, um, and that becomes you know, relevant as we go through as well, not just for um, treatment, but also for the, the CVRN kind of concept, right? So. I'm dealing with all that. I'm dealing with people coming and get sick, want to see me. I've got a triage and it's, I don't have a triage nurse. So the, the go-to system is no matter what's happening while I'm treating patients, you come in, you let me know that you've arrived. Then you let me know, um, or someone else lets me know what your injuries and illnesses. And then I have to recalibrate my triage to go, are you important now? Are you important later? Um, and, and, work my way through that, right? Because one, one thing I learned about the way we teach even mass cows is it's as if you're gonna have this perfect like triangle or something else, um, some kind of color code system, and it's not gonna change. Um, as you can probably notice, I'm not the biggest or strongest dude. And me moving you around in a circle over and over again because you're now suddenly not as important as the next guy, um, it's just not feasible. Um, so I just have to know where everything's at and kind of keep moving and assessing as we go. Um, and, and it kind of worked, but there's other areas where it kind of explodes in my face, right? And so then we can go ahead and move here, right? So now we're to phase three, right? So now at this point, we're at patients, I don't know, probably about 1,100 to kind of give you a rough idea. Um, I'm pretty good at mash cows at this point. That's, that's one thing I can definitely like, you know, put a little feather in my cap here, or like the feather behind me. It's kind of a big feather. Um, is at that point I can handle six, seven, you know, critically injured patients at a time relatively well before I consider myself at a mass cow. And that's important because that's where I'm in right now as you see this kind of situation where I am now kind of putting some puzzle pieces together, figuring out why I've got all these patients. Because again, I've always got to kind of understand the new ebbs and flows and the changes of how people are coming in and why they're coming in um, and how I'm going to control the amount of equipment I have, all these other factors, um, that come in. And so I've got all these little puzzle pieces. I'm trying to put them together, um, and try to figure things out. And while it's happening, and I'm dealing with all these different patients here. Um, these two little things up here on the left and right of the YPG, um, symbol there are some folks that come to me and they say, Hey, John, and, and it happened about five times, five different patients. If I can remember, again, I've been hitting the head a lot. So it could have been more, could have been a little bit less. Um, and they're like, I've got this rash. If you get a chance to come look at it, um, I got some allergy issues going on right here. Some of them had a little bit on their chin and they're like, could you take a look at that? And as I think you can probably imagine, I was like, yeah, that's cool. But I've got my, the forearms that you have are rashy. I've got my forearms inside this person right now. Um, can you just give me a second to at least like remove that? Um, and then maybe I can take a look at you a little bit. Please go over to the waiting area. Um, the waiting area obviously isn't huge. It's just don't be in my way and don't touch the Bialetti. Um, that's my one joy in the morning is my little cappuccino, right? So, so they know not to do that and that's it. And that keeps going five patients over you know, a couple of different mass cows throughout the day. Um, and then at about, I don't know, 7, 7.30, and I can say that time pretty confidently because that's usually by the time everything's kind of slowed down because nobody has night vision goggles, so the fight's only happening at certain times of the day um, before everybody's like, well, I can't see, I can't shoot, I'm just going to be done fighting. And then, unfortunately, if you're the guy who gets injured at around that time, you just lay there in the dirt uh, for several hours until the next morning and somebody comes and gets you and brings you back. So that's what's going on. And then this guy on the right-hand side here, 
I'm starting to get some more puzzles put together, right? I'm dealing with this non-Euclidean puzzle concept, right? So it's, and, and they're there and it's exponentially creating blind spots for me as I'm dealing with this. And that's kind of where it really gets bad, right? So now it's not, it's something that I was not anti-fragile. Um, if you don't know what that term is, look it up, but it's, think of fragile, get punched in the face, you're done, you're shat your jaw is shattered, you're out. Um, resilient or robust, you get punched, you kind of take a punch um, and you move on. Um, and then anti-fragile is the exact opposite. It's kind of like me in high school where you've, you've got the mouth of a 225 pound wrestler and you've got the body of a 12 year old girl. Um, so you just take punches all the time and you just keep getting stronger, um, theoretically, not this guy. Um, but some people do. I needed to be that, I wasn't that, right? Instead, this guy comes along and I got lucky and he says, hey, John, I've got these allergies I need you to look at. However, um, I just scraped off and it really hurts. I scraped these little yellow pills, right? Like right off of my arms. Um, I've learned recently that apparently not everybody was taught this over and over again and it wasn't literally beaten into them um, throughout some of their training, but, but for me it was. Little yellow pills are like the telltale sign of this wonderful, wonderful experience called mustard gas that we saw, you know, a lot in World War One, and then kindly we decided that maybe we'd stop using it, um, and then we apparently changed our minds. I didn't get the memo, so neither did these guys. So here I am. That's going on. That's what's happened. As you can see, the giant f bomb is dropped. I am in utter shock at that moment. Like, oh crap. I go instantly kind of flushed um, and thinking through and like they talk about your whole life passing before your eyes. I haven't had that happen, but I did have like a series of experiences where just like shutterfly events of like, hey, did you think of this? Did you think of this? Um, like a whole bunch of people just basically like versions of myself telling me I'm an idiot. Um, didn't you see this guy? Didn't you see this guy? So much so that I was actually telling Sean and Mike not too recently um, that I made a realization that the very first patient that we ever had, day one of the CCP, was like a roughly 12-year-old boy, um, and on the bottom of the feet, he's got two giant blisters on each foot um, and a couple on his ankles. And I remember treating him and just being like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Why is this here? And eventually, I just, I couldn't make sense of it. and I. I just said, whatever, he's not dying. I've got this, I'll handle it, we'll move on. Um, Mike helped me make myself feel like even more dumb the other day when he was like, he's like, John, just think about this, like um, the bottom of your feet is like the toughest skin area. And then you, then I added like, okay, well, this kid's 12. Um, he doesn't own shoes. He lives in Syria in the middle of a rev you know, revolution. Like his feet are probably tougher than my feet and I never wear shoes either right so like that's probably a sign oh yeah Veskins also tend to like you know moist areas like sweaty areas like I don't know the bottom of your feet should have probably picked that, that up too but again I didn't have all the pieces of a mindset and the way to address it and that's kind of honestly what I want to do here in this presentation today right is is attack that kind of concept um so there we are we just took a nice tour through John's experience um, and we're going to take a quick quick break and while we're doing that quick break and you know, getting ready to talk about um, something that's more like uh, like mindsets and the way I wish I would have thought about things take a look at this cool picture of a bunch of black dots um, I wonder in a little bit here if Lori can tell us um, you know I wonder if she sees something different when I showed it to her um, she saw probably what you see right and so then now that you see that, tell me that you don't see a cow, right? Um, so for any of you who, who didn't see a cow here, now you see a cow, here's the, the really crazy news is now you will forever see a cow, right? Because um, once you see it, it's really tough to unsee it. Um, that's not just true for things like this. That's true for experiences like when, the, I don't know, the patient comes straight to me and says, hey, John, I have allergies and I am in a stage where I don't want to deal with like all this other stuff. And he's walking, he's talking, um, he seems to be alive. And this guy um, below me is, 
you know, three units down. He's got a giant hole in his chest and I'm trying to deal with that. Like the last thing I want to deal with is allergies or think that it's something else. So I just said, yep, yeah, okay, cool. That's allergies. And that's what I called it, right? Um, so that is a prime example of something I wish I would have known, right? So this is the what I wish I would have known, uh, what I wish somebody would have taught me. Um, and then definitely what I absolutely tell pretty much anyone who will listen anymore. Um, so to a point where I, I almost get told to shut up. I probably do. I just don't hear it. Um, so one of the first things there is the categorization model versus sense making model, right? Ways. So I was categorizing. Um, seems like it works until it doesn't, right? Um, instead, I should have been doing like a sense making model. So sense making model is something where I have to actually engage with the environment. I have to contextualize the things I'm dealing with. Um, and when that happens, then I get information back. And now I can kind of um, go back and forth. Um, and that's how you solve nonlinear problems is with that kind of model um, instead of a linear problem where you can just shut the noise off and hear more signal, right? Um, so for everybody except for the millennials, I think of an AMF and dial, right? That's, so that's Spotify before Spotify was Spotify for you know Brock and a few other guys out there. Um, I think Ricky, you probably don't even know what the radio is either. Um, so in a, in a radio, I can turn off the, the noise that I don't want to hear and it will actually increase the signal, right? And the information that's salient that I need to know, where is in, in a nonlinear problem like this, I can't do that, right? I couldn't turn off, I chose to, I shouldn't have, turn off this stuff that I felt was not salient to me, right? I didn't engage with it. Um, had I done that, right? Maybe I would have noticed sooner, you know, not after there is now an unknown amount of um, exposure across the board, right? It's, it's on me. It's on my gear. It's been there for a couple of days now, right? Because I start talking to these guys and they, they haven't been to that area that they've figured out where it's at for like four to five days. So it's trumped. And how many patients have come through, right? Who knows? Here's another thing that it's, um, I, I go through these things so fast and it's just um, so much to cover. I also didn't cover like, this isn't a CCIR type situation, um, not a Creedence, you know, Clearwater revival, but a CCIR kind of scenario where the commanders um, then say, okay, we're dealing with NBC. Okay, we just stop or CBRN. We're not doing anything else. No, like patients are still coming through. I still have to address all these patients regardless. Um, and I have to kind of guess. And how do you guess if somebody's been exposed to other vesicants, other neuroagents or whatever, when they're just covered in burns? Who knows, right? Um, unless you can find ways to be a little more sensitive to um, things that are outliers, things that I could have maybe pay attention to. I don't know, like a little kid walking around with big old blisters on his feet, right? Um, so that's one of the main issues there I wish I would have known. Um, other things I wish I would have known are things like, how do I deal with that problem set instead of, um, trying to do best practices, right. And be told like, oh, I just got to follow what the other guy did. Um, know that that's not a thing, but principles do exist. And, um, Ricky Ditz will tell you over and over again. And so will, um, a few others that I can't shut up about HRO. That's why there's still Ewoks here who are like, knocking on your door and saying, hey, you know, can we tell you about our Lord and Savior, HRO or C3PO, either way, right? Um, but it's, it is a series of principles that helps us um, ensure that our organizations are consistently reliable, right? Um, again, this is not a presentation on that, but it's important to understand so that you can um, hopefully put yourself in this kind of concept, put yourself in my flip-flops, if you will, um, and know how to handle in a situation if you find yourself there, right? So those main principles, preoccupation with failure, reluctance to simplify, sensitivity to operations, commitment to resilience, and then a deference, not a difference, but a deference to expertise, right? Um, you can read up on those and kind of think about how that would have helped and engage in the environment um, and, and improved my ability to, to be more sensitive to um, the signs and, and things that I missed, right? So that gets us into the mindlessness, 
versus mindfulness, right? So this isn't the mindfulness there. I do all my meditation every morning um, and I do my yoga every day, uh, which is still important. I wanna earn my ability to wear hemp necklaces and have bead bracelets. So I still do those, right? Still get my sleep when I can. Um, but this is a, don't be mindless, right? Don't, don't do things just to do things. Think of um, you know, things like if I asked Sean, because he's old, uh, what to do when he hit a bunch of ice in his car, he's, he's going to tell me to go ahead and slam on his brakes, right? And then pump the brakes because he wants to make sure that he's safe. Um, if he pumps his brakes now, he's probably got an like brake system and that's not going to be the same safe thing. Um, and so you, you can't just do things just because that's why you've always done them. Um, you have to contextualize, you have to be mindful and, and realize that it could be different. Um, and you have to be welcoming of uncertainty is another, to me, the most important piece of that for this kind of scenario, right? If I'd have been more welcoming of these, like, oh, I don't know what that is, not, oh, that is this, then it would have been a lot easier. Um, and then lastly, for this, this really exciting but very busy slide for a lot of you um, that don't have ADHD and haven't been up for three nights um, studying is the, the, the drop the tools and run the jewels, right? So run the jewels for those of you that don't know, you, you should know. Um, it, quality rap band, but the point here is drop the tools, Carl Weick's discussion of making sure that we realize that we are more than just our tools, right? Um, you are a medic, not just because you have an aid bag or not because you know medicine, but because you're good, you're, you're good at your job, you know what looks right, you know what should look right. I knew it looked right, I knew what looked wrong. I didn't, I was, I was like, well, I don't have enough information to say what this is, so I must not be right. I must be just overthinking this rather than saying, no, I need to drop these tools um, that, and go, wait a second, I know it's not right. I'm addressing it. I need to kind of really stick to this and figure out what's going on, right? Um, and there's some great keynotes um, on these kind of things that we will make sure that you have some links to in the future to kind of read up more on that, right? So that's all the things I wish I would have known. I know it's super fast, um, but I also know that like, we've got to get through a lot of things and there's still more to come, right? So those are all the mindsets I wish I would have had, right? And here's some ways that applies, right? So Haggard the Haggard Chechen, right? Is, is the nickname that I gave him because he literally was, was gigantic, right? I know I'm not big, so I get that everybody looks gigantic to me, but he took up two litters. Um, his forearms looked like, you know, two of my thighs. Um, the man was massive. So that's where he gets it. But what, why is he important? Well, because he was smothered in, um, you know, blisters and things like that because he happened to have been making the, uh, the mustard gas that I, I ended up getting attacked with later um, and that we already exposed to. Because on top of the exposure that I'm talking about with the guys I treated, luckily for me, they actually went ahead and found ways to mortar it at the hospital um, and struck within about 250 meters um, several times. And I got to see the little puffs of, of different color gas. They didn't really disperse well. So he's apparently good at chemistry, not so good at explosions. I guess I'll take one over the other. Um, I don't know. Um, but what I learned there that I think is really important is labs are no longer confined to institutions. You don't have to go to Hogwarts to, to get a, a cool little potion class. Uh, apparently the guy just down the street in the Winnebago is giving some free meth classes. If everybody wants to go after this, I'm gonna try to hit it up. Um, but bottom line is people are making things in labs all over the place. And that's important because so are enemies, right? And so the ability to diagnose specifically is probably gonna be a little bit different, right? Um, so the, the goal and desire is to go ahead and be able to diagnose and categorize the events and be like, okay, this is definitely vesicant. This is definitely this. Truth is, what do you need to know? You need to know that you can identify anomalies. Like, is this different, right? Hey, John, is, is it different to have giant blisters on the bottom of your feet? Okay, maybe that one on its own isn't enough. Write that down. I didn't, if I didn't have another medic to talk about it to, I could have wrote it down. And then the next time I saw a blister, I could have been like, oh, wait, that's the second time you know, fool me once, um, you know, I think George Bush said it really well, um, fool me twice, shame on me or something, 
But bottom line is, right, like check out these anomalies and be sensitive to them. And then when you have those, then you can isolate them. I don't need to know exactly what it is in that environment. I need to know that it's not what I want on me and my patients. So now it's isolated, right? Then I can decontaminate it. That I might need to know a little bit more of what it is to decontaminate, but at that point I've already isolated it. You're not in my shoes, but you have to deal with the fact that you realize that half your gear is now contaminated at best, um, maybe at, at worst also inside someone. Um, and then you adjust from there, right? Which is what I'm doing at this point, right? I've done my best to recalibrate again and going, okay, well, I did what I could. Let's move forward and kind of adjust and figure out a way to, to deal with this. Um, I wish I could say that was it, right? And, that, and the punch has stopped. Um, but as luck would have it, uh, we got to go into John Johnson's punch out, which is kind of like Mike Tyson's, but just not in an airplane. Um, so um, I do routine re um, reviews of a lot of my um, different case studies and my experiences. Um, one, because I'm obsessive compulsive and I don't ever sleep. Um, but two, because I just um, have a kind of a system and a ritual of learning, teaching myself to relook at things. And it kind of helps me um, not become overly um, cumbersome by all the information. Um, and uh, I, don't, I would call it, I guess, survivor's guilt, if you will, um, that happens. So in that event, I was looking at this and I started noticing that um, in a lot of checking operations, I kept seeing neurotoxins tied to it, right? So that's, okay, that's a bummer. Um, I also then learned that some signs and symptoms of these types of things included seizures and night terrors 72 hours around post-exposure. Why does that matter? Well, because this cool dude here um, who's given us like the 3,000-mile the stare, or they, that's what I thought originally, and I thought it was a PTSD shell shock event because he just watched two of his buddies turn into vapor, um, and he had a bunch of nightmares, but it was about three days from the last time we got mortared, um, and so I did a whole cool thing, and I wrote up this like letter to his commander and explained how they need to kind of have guys have an R&R &R system. And I was all proud of myself until this year later. And I'm like, oh crap, that's what that is. How do I know it's probably that? Well, because I was also unfortunately experiencing a, a number of other neurological conditions. Um, so I'm not just already weird enough on my own and have the ADHD issues, but now I've got like my eyes, if you can, see me anytime you can see my eyes every once in a while do like a little nice nystagmus bouncing around like ping pong balls um i was sometimes fainting in the middle of the hallways um i spent like 45 minutes at a bookshelf because i just lost time right um kind of like this presentation i'll always wake up in a little bit here and be done and didn't know what i did um but so i had all these things and i'm like oh crap that means this right and so then i also brought back some other survivors guilt issues like oh i exposed a buttload of my friends then to these kind of experiences possibly. And I, I say that to say like, not like, hey, what a terrible dude I am, but there's no way to know in these Buka T squared kind of environments. And then you add the fact that people are hand making them, right? How do we know that it's just mustard gas or it's just this, right? So don't simplify it and just treat it as, as a toxin or a exposure and simply leave it at that, right? Um, so that's that's the uh, wonderful punch out that I got to deal with, right? So try to speed this up and, and get through so that we can have time for questions, other things. What does all this mean, right? Well, one, it means that John did not do as great a job as he wanted to, right? But that's not the point. Like, I think I did a lot of other good things and I've done a really good job at taking a, a step back, look at these issues, and going, how do I learn? How do I engage in this environment and prove the rest of the guys out there? So a wise man once said, if you want a mountain bike in the Moab, you got to remove the training wheels, right? All right. Um, and if I was a little bit more talented like Julie, I would have like, you know, something that doesn't look like a child just through these training wheels flying off. But I, I did what I did, but the point is like, you've got to take those off, right? that doesn't mean you shouldn't ever have them. And I think that's the key part that a, a lot of us miss is you have to start somewhere, right? You, you have to train with some of these things. The problem is then we stay there, 
right? So Pavlovian training is the number one thing that we all do. And it's, I know what I'm training on. I'm training, I'm going to train medicine today. I know the, the environment. I know the mission set. I know all the variables. Well, guess what? Like I've never been on a mission that I knew everything. Um, even good medics have never been on missions that they knew everything was going to happen, right? So don't train that way. Instead, do dynamic training, right? Don't do training silos. What does that mean? Like, don't just train medicine on its own. Don't train CBRN like we do, right? Like, as if we are only going to do that. You're still going to have other patients. People are still going to shoot at you. Um, you're still going to have to get the mission done because it's operational medicine. It's not doctor medicine. You may be a doctor out there, but you're not doing doctor medicine. You're trying to get a mission accomplished. Um, so you have to do full spectrum. You have to involve all the other people that are normally going to be involved in it to do it. Um, avoid semantic satiation. What is that? It's when you say something so many times, it no longer has meaning. Um, so for me, hearing guys say, um, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, no, slow is smooth. And then you just keep doing it slow and smoothly. And now you're a really, really slow, um, smooth snail. Good job. You're still dead. Right. Um, the actual saying that Wider said was to do slow things slow and fast things fast. Think of for anybody out there that's in the military, think of your jump master school where you do certain things really fast because they don't matter as much and they won't fail you for missing one thing. But if you fail any spots that are buckles, things that connect you to that parachute, it's what that's really important and you're going to fail. So you have to slow down there so you make up time other places that you go fast. That's what that means. So preserve the meaning of the term. Um, before you move on. If you don't know what it means, don't say it. Like when I was prepping this presentation, I said something about um, the elephant in the room. I ended up with a three hour rabbit hole where I studied where that came from. It was the Russians. Um, so thanks guys, kind of ironic now. Um, but the bottom line is if you don't know what it means, don't say it, right? Um, blind obedience is the next thing. There are times where you want a private or somebody who's below you to, to blindly follow, got it, but they, should be encouraged once they start to know things to be skeptical and to ask questions. Algorithmic approach, um, I'm famous for saying how much I think that teacher will see was very, very detrimental to the combat medic um, because we tried to apply algorithms to guys who should have known um, how to do a patient assessment. I think it's good for when you need it, but it's not good for when you don't need it. You can't ignore the environmental pathology or it can be very dangerous. Um, and then Lastly, like, just don't be ISIS. When I say that, uh, I say this joke, but it's seriously, it's, it's don't take things out of context, right? Contextualism is important. The context of the environment and the mission set matters. Um, if you, you can make anything sound like anything if you just take it out of its context, right? So um, I think I've made close to my time. Um, so I'm gonna kind of praise myself for that. But that's in a nutshell, I, I know it's super fast. I know there's a lot of other things. I hope you guys have questions, but I'm going to pass it over to Mike, let him chat a little bit, and then we'll all kind of get together and hopefully answer some questions. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I think your timing is perfect. If you want to un uh, yep. share your screen, I'll pull up some slides. Um, pull these up real quick here. All right. So, uh, just kind of some some quick things with with John's discussion. Uh, I, I tried to curate my slides relevant a little bit to his experience. And the first thing I want to say is uh, if we come to a presentation on chemical warfare agents and I show you some pictures, you're going to immediately say, oh, this has got to be some kind of a chemical warfare agent. If I took you to a presentation on trauma, as John expected with his CCP, and I sprinkled in among 400 casualties, five people with what looked like contact dermatitis, you are not making this connection. So nothing I'm saying here is an indictment of his performance or failure to recognize these people early. Nobody was going to pick this up because it's too subtle. So that being said, uh, sulfur mustard, the only chemical warfare agent that I'm going to talk about, 
is a, a, a pretty significant problem still, both on the battlefield as well as from a terrorist use standpoint, uh, because it was so ubiquitous. These are 155 millimeter artillery shells in the US inventory. In 1997, the US had 60,000 of these, not to mention sulfur mustard in all sorts of other containers. The issue here is unlike a nuclear weapon of which there are few and they are generally large, uh, these shells are very portable. And some of these shells have been turned into IEDs in Iraq and Syria. And even the people laying them probably didn't necessarily know that it was a mustard agent. They just thought it was an artillery shell. And that's, that's part of the issue is that they're, they're very easy to use. Sulfur mustard was the most casualty producing agent from World War I. It was felt to be responsible for 70% of all casualties, uh, more so than cyanide, chlorine gas, and phosgene that had preceded it. And what's interesting is sulfur mustard entered World War I fairly late in the war, but because it essentially damages what it touches, and the service members at this point were used to inhalational agents and pretty good putting on protective masks. They didn't have as much breathing in exposure. It was more skin exposure. Mm -hmm. The next time it was used uh, was in the Iran-Iraq war from 83 to 88. 45,000 casualties are a safe estimate. The actual number could be more. And there's a lot of debate regarding the actual mortality or death rate from a sulfur mustard exposure. During World War II, it was felt to be two to 5% fatal. There's some Iran-Iraq data that it might've been up to 14%, but we have to kind of bias that. That 14% fatality rate were Iranian casualties um, exposed during the war by the Iraqis who then were kazavak to Belgium. And if you're gonna point out to the world that Iraq is using chemical weapons for the first time since 1918, you don't send your least injured casualties. So the actual death rate might be, uh, might've been lower there. Uh, as John experienced firsthand, it was used pretty extensively during the Syrian civil war and ISIS, ISIL, uh, Daesh did use it in Iraq, and there were multiple casualties that were exposed during the siege to retake Mosul. This is kind of some close-up photos of what these skin exposures look like. Uh, this is a Kurdish fighter from 2016, and you'll see what John was taught are these little yellow pills. That was a term I had never heard before. Uh, these fluid-filled ve vesicles or blisters, that's why these are called vesicants or blister agents. You do have some surrounding redness or erythema. At a glance, this could be a thermal burn. This could be somebody got exposed to some kind of heat or um, a splash of scalding water. One of the things that's different is these burns tend to be a bit more superficial than thermal burns, and they don't tend to be as painful. The photo on the uh, photos on the right are two individuals who had the same, uh, the same exposure on extremities uh, in this kind of weird pattern. The photo on the far right, to me, looks a lot like what I would call contact dermatitis. Did this person have some kind of an allergic reaction to something that got on their skin? Uh, and so if you see these, you're, you're not going to pick up on the first, the first one of these casualties. It's going to take a couple before you start identifying exactly what you're seeing here. This is data from World War I. 80 to 90 percent of all of the sulfur mustard casualties did have some kind of skin lesions. Regular clothing is not fairly protective from this because it does uh, vaporize in the air. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about eye involvement shortly, but a huge amount of these casualties will have eye involvement. Uh, the majority, three-fourths, will have some airway damage or injuries. We'll talk about that. And the World War I mortality was 2.2%. When casualties die from these exposures, it tends to be about four days later, usually because they have some kind of respiratory compromise. So if we talk about ocular involvement, which can be one of the first things that shows up, uh, generally within an hour is casualties complain about very gritty, sore, and bloodshot eyes. That could be allergic conjunctivitis from pollen in the air. This uh, top photo is a Syrian casualty from 2016 who had a fairly significant exposure. 
Uh, that could be conjunctivitis, it could be some viral eye infection. In a CCP full of people that are dying, this goes in the category of, I don't really care, and you're gonna miss it. Eventually, they will get some more significant findings. They start to get some eyelid swelling, a lot of photosensitivity, blethrospasm, where they literally have to pry their eye open. And eventually the cornea, the clear part of your eye, uh, becomes very clouded and swollen and you can get temporary blindness. The uh, cartoon there on the low left is from the Atlas of Gas Poisonings that the Red Cross published in 1918 to familiarize people from this World War I uh, situation. It's kind of a bad photo, but you take them where you can. This is a Syrian casualty. I believe that's a photo of their back. Pretty significant exposure here. We can see these huge fluid filled vesicles or blisters. Uh, and again, we get hot, red, itchy as opposed to painful skin. And as John had mentioned before, one of the hallmarks on vesicants and sulfur mustard is they like thin, moist skin, like your groin, your rectum, your armpits. Uh, and unlike thermal burns, these burns take a lot longer to heal, sometimes up to months. The cartoon on the left there is also from that Red Cross Atlas of Gas Poisoning. You can Google for it. It's available online. Uh, and this was a casualty that was drawn day five after his mustard exposure. He had been exposed for about four hours. He did wear a protective mask for three of uh, for 30 minutes of that four hour exposure. I don't know whether that was the beginning or the end, but we see a couple things. We see his ocular involvement there, his red swollen bloodshot eyes, uh, kind of your first indicator. And then the skin changes, the burns in hot, moist places. Uh, it's almost what I've referred to as the reverse sunburn. It's the direct opposite of what you'd see with sun exposure. And then the casualty on the right is an Iranian that was medevaced to Belgium who has almost the same identical presentation. Part of the reason we, I wanted to show you these is these are the, the images you put in your mental Rolodex, although I'm dating myself, uh, in your brain. So five years from now, if you take care of a casualty who has this, you look at it and you're like, that's kind of weird. I think I've seen that before. This is also from that Atlas of Gas Poisoning. The uh, buttock on the left was a casualty who had sat on some wet ground, some mustard had seeped through his uh, pants, burned him, and then a short time later, you get this color change, this staining of the, uh, of the wound or the burn, and that is also uh, unique to mustard. And in one of John's photos of one forearm, it almost looked like we were starting to see a little bit of this bluish purple decolor discoloration. Again, on the right, uh, we see a lot of involvement in genitals. And based on World War II data, 42% of casualties actually had scrotal involvement. And so I make the argument that you're in a trench in World War I um, and your testicles and your butthole is burned. It's an awesome, awesome agent to be exposed to. You do run risks of what are called secondary infection because obviously these are areas that can get infected and they're trying to depict that a little bit on the slide on the right there. <clears throat> Four separate casualties, all uh, transported from Iraq, sorry, Iran to Belgium during the Iran-Iraq war. We've got, again, John's version of the small yellow pills in the top right, about 16 hours after exposure in this casualty's back. Top left, sorry, top left. Top right, we've got the Iranian whose blisters have already started breaking open in the back of the hand. Low left, 17 hour post exposure. Uh, on the forehead and then uh, under the left eye there and kind of it almost looks like snot, a line of some vesicles there from, from again, these skin burns. And then the casualty on the right really looks like a thermal burn, a significant burn. We've got this huge sheet of burned skin that's sloughed off, but it's all from mustard agent. And then you can see um, a little bit of the skin discoloration kind of indicating uh, again, maybe that little bit of a clue that we're dealing with something besides a thermal burn. You do get respiratory involvement. This photo is a uh, child, a young person who was exposed in northern Turkey from an IED that went off, uh, was taken, sorry, exposed in Syria and then crossed over into Turkey. Uh, this tends to take four to eight hours to show up, and it looks a lot like 
uh, an allergic reaction, runny nose, sore throat, I've got some hoarse voice. Some experts from World War I said that they thought the hoarse voice was another uh, indicator that if you had this constellation of findings at a hoarse voice, you should start thinking about things like sulfur mustard. And then we get red swollen oral cavities. One of the things, again, though these burns can look a little bit, injuries can look a little bit like thermal burns, they don't swell the same. So you don't get the kind of oral swelling that you get with uh, thermal burns. And then the arrow there is kind of pointing to this ulceration where the blister in the back of this kid's palate um, already sloughed off. Uh, they'll get some dry cough with it. Uh, and then they can actually get big sloughing, which looks like a pseudomembrane, which you see with diphtheria, not that you ever really see diphtheria anymore. This is a cartoon from that atlas of gas poisoning of a tongue at the top, epiglottis, the little flap that covers your airway and then that trachea, or your breathing tube the whole way down. And you'll see at the top, it's all red and swollen and burned. And then we get this gray discoloration because the inner lining of your airway uh, and your lung passages are basically dead and sloughed. And again, one of the keys or clues that this is happening or that this casualty was exposed to this is they'll cough and they'll actually cough up the lining of their lung. Uh, think of it as like the blister that just sloughed off. 80% of sulfur mustard that's applied to human skin is just gonna evaporate on its own. It's not really gonna cause us any problems, although it is gonna contaminate the environment. 10% is gonna penetrate the superficial skin and cause all the effects I've just shown you. Another 10% is gonna be absorbed systemically. And this leads to problems with bone marrow suppression, which is essentially how ionizing radiation kills you by suppressing your bone marrow. And then you have bleeding and infection complications. A 20% body surface area involvement from sulfur mustard is the LD50 or the lethal dose 50, the amount necessary to kill 50% of the population. If you take five milliliters of military grade sulfur mustard, which is a mustard packet from McDonald's and smear it evenly over your body, that is a 25% body surface area exposure, which will kill 50% of the people exposed. It doesn't take a lot. This uh, is a fairly old photo from some military training where they actually used to expose people to these agents in training. Uh, the L is lewisite, which is a vesicant that never got used during World War I, it came in too late, it was a big fear for World War II, and then the lower the M there is mustard. Different concentrations basically showing the, uh, the burn effects there, and again, John's little yellow pills. If you know you have mustard contamination because somebody sounded an alarm and told you that you were being mustard gas shelled and you remove it off your skin in two minutes, you get zero effect. It's very easily decontaminated. By five minutes, you're going to get a 50% reduction in your burn. By 15 minutes, 10% reduction. So it is uh, absorbed into the skin and it's going to do its thing pretty rapidly. There is a sense that because some of this being very oily can uh, remain on the skin, that no matter how long after you're exposed, you get a casualty, you should still consider decontaminating them. John, in uh, previous discussions on this event, struggled with once he started to identify that there was a chemical warfare agent exposure and it was probably mustard, how the hell am I going to decontaminate people, made a request for reactive skin decontamination lotion, uh, which initially was denied. And then when some uh, was offered up, it was expired, which it sounds like the DOD was not willing to get him. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what are your other options? You can use 0.5% bleach. Remember that household bleach with the Clorox bottle there is 5%. You can use that to decontaminate equipment, but not people, not skin. But if you dilute it 10 to one, uh, that is a safe enough uh, decontamination solution to use on skin. Is it as good as RSDL? No, but it will, it does have some efficacy. If you don't do that, then your only other option is going to be soap and water. It's going to work for some agents. It's not going to work for others. It's not really going to be effective for some of the nerve agents like VX. Uh, but this is basically your flowchart on treatment decontamination options. 
one of the things that came up when John was talking about this was that uh, some of the RSDL they were um, offered or was discussed might be sent to them was going to be expired. And this was actually a study where a researcher took 36 guinea pigs, exposed them to the amount of VX nerve agent that would kill a quarter of those guinea pigs and broke them into three 12 guinea pig groups. They used RSDL that was in date, deconned the guinea pigs, nine out of 12 survived. That's exactly what you'd expect with an LD25. They then took RSDL that was three and a half years expired. It kept the same amount of guinea pigs alive. They then took RSDL that was five years expired. It worked similarly. So the teaching point is if my only choice was expired RSDL, I would absolutely use it. However, your actual life-saving results may vary because to do this experiment, they kept the expired RSDL in a research lab. So it was in an air conditioned environment. The, uh, the manufacturer in the DOD says that RSDL exposed to temperatures up to 120 degrees has a uh, two year uh, shelf life. And if it ever gets above 120, uh, its expiration date is six months. So if you buy it off, eBay because you know Mike Shirt said that RSDL that's expired for five years is as good as factory RSDL. I'm not making that guarantee. I'm just trying to give you food for thought in the situation you might be presented with. Finally, Fuller's Earth, which is an absorbent clay pictured there in the top center, was the decontamination option of um, choice during World War I. It is purely physical decontamination. It absorbs the sulfur mustard off your skin into the clay. It does not decon it does not neutralize it in any way. One of the problems is it has to be on your skin for a while to start absorbing the agent. Uh, which can be a little bit of a problem because if it's not on long enough, it doesn't absorb. If it's on too long, some people get a contact dermatitis reaction to it, which, oh, is going to look a lot like your vesicant or sulfur mustard exposure. Um, and you can buy it off Amazon directly out of uh, India there in the uh, Fuller's Earth powder. Uh, it's also a little bit of a secondary exposure risk because it's uh, a, a clay absorption. Theoretically, it could aerosol uh, and people could, could breathe that in. All right, those are the slides I wanted to share with you on sulfur mustard. And at this point, uh, I'll turn it over to Sean to uh, speak eloquently on whatever comes through his head, which is always a surprise to all of us, including Sean. It really is. Actually, it's not going to be too, too much because I'm so barfing in my mouth from the slide of the uh, exposure of the buttocks and genitals. So thank you very much for that, man. Um, I was having a great day up until that. So I that's why it's a right? That was my favorite slide. I don't know what you're talking about. I know. I, I've seen it on your walls and in your wallet. That's a cute uh, thing that you have. I'll try to make this quick, as fun as uh, everybody that knows me is laughing right now. Um, but to go over, obviously, we had to condense this quite a bit, and and we're talking about potentially doing kind of a thing with with John, uh, Mike, and I, uh, where we just kind of discuss a lot of the questions that we may not be able to hit or anything else that comes in. But real quick, just to kind of key it up, since uh, JJ and I spent uh, the night together on Zoom going over a bunch of stuff, and uh, neither one of us felt like sleeping, but one thing real quick with, with the cow is, is the big thing with that slide that he had originally is once something is categorized, um, we will always see it like that. We, we, we get this kind of innate bias uh, to where we can't see uh, anything else. And, you know, it kind of comes from a presentation that Ellen Langer did on mindfulness, uh, which you described before, isn't necessarily the uh, Zen Buddhist version of just uh, mindless mindfulness just being aware of what's going on and appreciating the novel and the cow sets kind of a good example is once something's categorized uh it kind of focuses into hammering a, the circle peg through the square hole a lot of times to make it fit that category uh which is very problematic which keeps us kind of from seeing something that may be novel and and i think you can kind of see in jj's discussion where that kind of fit in uh, he also brought up best practices versus principles, and best practices are one of those things that that um, are, is very difficult for us to do, whether we're talking about rescue or rigging or we're doing medicine, when we don't have all the tools to be able to um, do proper uh, work of a diagnostician, if you will. So to initiate that best practice, it's not that just that I can diagnose the exact 
same thing. It's that to, to be able to do that, when we look at certain really, um, I guess, successful versions of, of evidence-based medicine within oncology or pediatric obesity and things like this, is that we're not only able to diagnose that, but we're able to show that there aren't any co-issues that are going to confound that. And at each bifurcation, we can say it could be this or this, and we're able to you know, use computed tomography, we're able to use ultrasounds, we're able to use these things to be able to give us the exact answer when in John's case and really anybody pre-hospital um, doesn't really necessarily have that capability because one small little difference is going to make a, a huge error. So that's why a lot of that focus was based on principles. Uh, he mentioned risk versus uncertainty and didn't have enough time to go through there. Um, I would encourage anybody that's listening to this that has to fill out risk assessment forms to look at some of um, Gerd uh, uh, Giggers, who's out of the Planck Institute, um, who's written a psychotic amount on heuristics that goes into great detail on how risk cannot be handled the same way that uncertainty is handled. And by definition, uh, just to, to read it to you, is, is when we can calculate risk, whether it's on a, uh, an operational mission set, uh, like Jay was talking about, or for, for a tactical team on, on a high-risk warrant or anything like that, risk can really only be applied where we know all the options, consequences, and probabilities. They're all known. Then we can actually put uh, an actual probability to that with a percentage number and then mitigate that efficiently. Uncertainties, we just don't do that. And unfortunately, a lot of people, um, because we don't have training in how to deal with uncertainty, will either come up with some BS number, uh, and which will always bite you in the ass uh, when that comes around, or just not deal with it. And so, you know, John and I discussed this quite a bit, where was the possibility of uh, chemical exposure present? You're in Syria, man. So yeah, it, it is. And, but what is that number? What is that probability if you got to put a number to that? And you could just as easily say zero or a hundred percent. So that doesn't work well on most of our risk assessment uh, or mitigation sheets. So with that, that's where, you know, Gerd has written so many papers, academic papers um, out of the Planck Institute on how to mitigate that through the use of deliberate heuristics. And, and anybody that has to worry about risk mitigation forms, I would suggest absolutely study it and read it. Uh, and it'll keep you from getting sucker punched all day long or looking like a complete idiot. So, you know, with that, a heuristic in the most simple terms is is kind of a basic rule of thumb that you can uh, adapt to the situation because it's uncertain. So you're not exactly sure what you're going to get. So, you know, one heuristic that probably every medical person from paramedic uh, EMT pre-hospital is always taught is, you know, between the ages on a female, between the ages of X and Y, you know, 15 to, to 42, uh, you know, any abdominal pain is, is an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise type of thing. We don't have the ability to, to figure out exactly what's going on in that abdominal complaint. So we assume it's kind of the worst. So in a case of, of JJ at a very basic level is, uh, I can't put a number to this guys, but you know, we are in Syria, this could be a problem. That heuristic could be as simple as saying, listen, if you see any kind of freaking skin irritation or anything, like shout it out and it's gonna be considered that until proven otherwise, we'll pull that separate person aside. It'll take a priority of John to be able to look at that and see exactly what that is. And from there, we may have to change what our course of action is in dealing with that. That's a very simplistic form of it and it gets much more detailed, but I would absolutely suggest people look at that um, and what's kind of crazy about it is it's not like this is a new concept um, there's a paper by a guy named Frank Knight written in 1921 on economics how risk and uncertainty have to be handled completely different so it's not necessarily something new if you consider 1921 uh, in the in the near past uh, then we may need to rethink how we handle that um, another thing he mentioned was training wheels and I think that's a huge part is we learn and we're not dogging people that use algorithms. Um, you know, if we trace algorithms back, we'll find that it was actually, you know, kind of originated back in the industrial era with weave uh, loom operators. So it's good that we use it in ACLS and stuff, I guess, but um, it's, uh, please take all the sarcasm that was meant in that comment as sarcastic. Uh, it, we need to learn how to think. And when we learn how to think, we don't need those tools as much anymore. And 
but we need it when we start off. Uh, we need hard lines of linearity, linear stuff. And then with experience, you start seeing that like it doesn't really fit everything. Things there, there's a lot of room in that gray area. And uh, I think one of the best examples uh, was a buddy that we write with a lot with for high reliability stuff, HRO. Van Trelin, um basically was one of the only medical directors uh, in the United States that didn't really have protocols for his uh, paramedics at that time. Taught him how to just treat pathophysiology. And the example he gave was a 68, 70 year old male that, that had a significant history of, of respiratory issues and, and heart issues. And doctor wanted him to, to get out and start getting some exercise. So in the San Bernardino area, in the high desert, decided to go for like a 20 minute walk and ended up getting lost with no water, no nothing. And they didn't find him until somewhere around like the 38 hour mark uh, after being lost with some very hot days, some very cold nights. And the medics found him in severe CHF, um, like full CHF but extremely severe dehydration. So, you know, what is your protocol for the um, extremely dehydrated CHF patient? Uh, and for most protocols, when you linearize things, they would be in conflict with one another. Um, but they treated the pathophysiology and gave them, you know, bumps of fluid uh, and never ended up having to treat the CHF just with the Frank Starling and, and things like this. Um, so, you know, getting beyond that is kind of what he mentioned as far as taking the training wheels off um, the last two things I want to hit on real quick is, is the slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And, and I credit, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, who's, I've learned a lot from through the years, uh, at the organization he's with, but, um, you know, in the end, slow is smooth, smooth is fast is, is great when you're first learning something, uh, you're do doing a different kind of mag change. You're doing this and you're throwing rounds all over uh, the place and slowing it down, getting muscle memory on whatever new input you're putting into that system that you're learning is definitely valid. Um, and, but that should be a very temporary thing until you get the muscle memory down. In the end, you have people two years from now still moving slower than a snail, snail on quaaludes, um, justifying it by um, saying that that somehow in a parallel universe of marvel that whatever they're doing is somehow fast and it's it's so not um the actual quote the original quote was you know do slow things slow and uh do fast things fast and slow things slow move as fast as you can as slow as you have to um speed saves lives and in the end when you think about that it's a never-ending job until either the day you die or the day you retire on uh, constantly improving the speed in which you do everything and not just the fast things and moving those things but those things and i would say slow could also be something mindful um to where you don't necessarily have to be slow but you do have to put a little bit more in your head before you you initiate that action and it, it would be a never ending process. And most of the rigging that we do, the emergency bailouts we do, um, vehicle extrication we do, uh, we use shot timers uh, to be able to figure out exactly how long does it take you to replace that blade you just broke on your saw. So what, what is that time to evac six people out for an emergency egress, uh, vertical egress out of it? And you're able to see so much more of what really makes a difference. And in every nonlinear system, there's an exponent. When you find that exponent, making small changes that make huge differences in your performance. And the last thing I was going to bring up that we didn't have a chance to talk about is realize when you're looking in these seaburn environments, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to do quite a bit of training on um, a, a lot of a lot of things in that environment, um, in various environments, uh, especially as it pertains to rescue packaging, moving vertical um, and horizontal, is material science is something we're really Far behind on and realize that when you're looking at a lot of the gear you're doing it for instance you know there was something vertical that went in in that environment look at the the material that your harnesses are made out of you know some people who do, your ropes are made out of uh let alone your anchors and things like that uh in many cases they'll last somewhere in that 25 to 30 second mark before they completely fail and so start digging into some of the material science uh, things there's some incredible fibers out there with just finished uh, helping to design a rope with Ada Red uh, using a Negra, which, you know, you can go into like 196 hours in hydrofluoric acid and it doesn't lose strength. Um, you know, Dyneema, those type of things are out there that, that have some good performance parameters, but the good always comes with some bad. So studying that is, is what will allow you to turn your skill sets really into um, a craft, really. Thanks, Sean. 
So uh, a couple of questions that came through, one of which Sean dealt with briefly, you know, was there intel that there were chemical weapons there? Yes, in 2011, Syria was felt to have one of the most robust chemical weapons programs in uh, the Middle East. But if we look at John's numbers, and John, I'm paraphrasing, but you figured 400 mm -hmm. casualties across your CCP? So in total, by the time I was done in a matter of four months, I had about um, roughly 3,000. Um, I treated 1,400 myself. Um, I had a, another medic that showed up later. And gotcha. did, um, so if you look at that denominator and you figure in retrospect, maybe five of your casualties you now figure out had a mustard exposure. Uh, that is a minuscule amount of people. I would agree, but I also say like that's that I know of, right? Like, of course, of course, you know. And so there's there's that factor. Um, the dispersal rate from what we were seeing, right? So there's somebody else about the asked about the Chechen and who he was. Um, we'll just say that um, he's not with us anymore, unfortunately, or fortunately, and he was really good at doing chemistry. Um, so um, what we do know is it was a lot of the stuff that that I ended up dealing with is was homemade. And so I think that that's going to affect some things, right? Um, sure. I also was asked originally um, to not necessarily, I was asked, how do I know that that's what it is? Um, so I, I said, that, okay, cool. And I asked to go ahead and redact every one of my um, SF-600s because I, all, I wasn't there when everybody got shot, stabbed, blown up, um, et cetera. But the bottom line is, is there's a, a reluctance to say, that's what it is. And that's, that's a lot of that uncomfortable with uncertainty. Um, so it's, it's a balance, but you are right. Like it was definitely not the numbers that we were saying it is mm -hmm. or that we, we feel like it is because it's, so, it's right. such a shock um, or then, we don't know at least. And then we think about, so you got a casualty with a blast injury from the mortar shell that went off with all the penetrating blast trauma and you expect some thermal burns. Oh, and then the next day or several hours after their injury, they now have blisters and vesicants, uh, anybody is going to just simply look at that and go, well, yeah, I expect some of that with the thermal part of this. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to identify some of these casualties who also have other trauma. So in that respect, even if you have intel, all you can do is, John, uh, as Sean is saying, is heighten your suspicion for it. But unless, until you get one that's classic, somebody with a reverse sunburn, anybody's going to be hesitant to send the bell to the balloon up and go, yep, that's it. Because mm -hmm. you're like, I don't know. I've never seen this before. Have you seen this before? We need somebody from the Iran-Iraq war to confirm this is what it actually looks like. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, it, it goes back to like some of the different sayings of like nobody ever got fired for buying an IBM, things like that. People, it, without HRO, people are reluctant to say things, right? And that's kind of why HRO came up in this kind of conversation is you need to be willing to, I would rather you tell me, hey, I think that's mustard gas, don't put it on your hot dog, um, and it's not mustard gas, then you go, hey, I think that's mustard, put it on your hot dog, and it's mustard gas. Right. The, right. Uh, there's also been an argument made by some chemical weapons experts, particularly with regard to nerve agents, that anybody with a college level chemistry degree has the technical ability to make nerve agents let alone these lower level chemical warfare agents. Um, so this is a pretty you know, operational threat for everybody, not even to add in uh, much like the methamphetamine and illicit drug trade that we're all dealing with you know, throughout the world in EMS, that these things aren't being made in military or pharmacy grade labs. So who knows exactly what else is in the mustard that was exposed? Yep. Exactly. Somebody um, asked a question regarding detection systems. There are, uh, the military uses what's called M8 detector paper, which you can actually also buy off uh, Amazon and off the internet. Uh, it will turn colors with uh, nerve agent exposures, including the fourth generations, as well as vesicants, but it won't really be more specific than that. I don't think that would have helped John at all because he didn't have a little oily drop to put the paper in to test with. There are Drager systems that work pretty well as well. But again, I don't think there's a way to do that on your casualty that you're seeing hours to potentially a day later. Uh, 
And then somebody asked about CBRN moulage to try to integrate CBRN casualties in trauma scenarios. I think that's what would be required for us to start seeing this. There are some companies that make some moulage, although I, to be honest, I'm not sure how good it is from a, a, you know, a CBRN standpoint. Um, somebody put in the chat, moulage sciences is one. I know Simulates does some as well, but again, I, I, I can't really speak to the, to the quality of, um, yeah. of that material. I think with that stuff, like the material could be tough, but the, the moulage, the training portion is about setting the scenario up, right? Um, and so that you're just addressing that part, right? Um, even if it's just suddenly you go in as an instructor and say, okay, guess what? You've been exposed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now what are you going to do? It's a critical thinking exercise now of like the scenario I was in. Okay, so we saw the, the picture there where my, my stuff is everywhere, right? I have to make the best guess I can of what can I, what do I think I can decon? What do I think I can't, right? Practicing that before you're in that scenario versus practicing that while you're in my scenario are very different. You're taking a lot different risks in that kind of scenario. So I think just doing that, right? Um, admitting to yourself that people probably aren't going to tell you that they used chemical weapons against you is a good step. And so now how do I integrate that? Well, I just, I can just, tell the patient, tell the medic, hey, hey, you missed it. Well, how do I know? Because I told you to, I'm in charge, right? Um, uh, normally, you don't want to do those things in training because you're just making up things. But this is kind of an environment where now you're just forcing him to go, him or her go through that critical thinking of, okay, what do I do now? What gear is so important to me that I got to figure out how to do it? Um, the one thought that I had is in, in retrospect, the one thing I take from this is any um, medical equipment requested for a CCP, you need bleach. You need yep. bleach to decontaminate litters from you know, biological contamination. And you can use bleach right out of the bottle to decontaminate equipment, not as good as other techniques, but doable versus dilute on casualties. Um, that that might be your multi-purpose solution, knowing it's not gonna be as good as RSDL. I, I totally agree. And then on top of that, it, it's things like just um, thinking about like, how do I handle this? What gear can I lose? Um, and also factors of like, speaking of bleach, like most of my patients that I had in Syria, they were so dirty, just dirt alone that I use on average anywhere from four to eight Curlex rolls just to clean them to do a, a proper assessment. Sure. Right. Um, eventually I bought laundry machines and, and towels, but the bottom line is, is those are factors that as you get into dense urban environment, you get to see your, like, these things change and think about that. Um, how am I cleaning this guy off as best I can? Um, you know, and you're just doing the best you can. Somebody asked the question about uh, how we expect this to be dispersed in an urban or civilian environment. And the answer is we have no idea. Uh, ISIS has used drones, you know, uh, we know from from 1995, 94, 95 in Tokyo, uh, that their you know garbage bags full of dilute sarin was a reasonable dispersion method. John got mortared. It could be it could be anything. It could be you know if you make a small quantity of this, you're going to splash it on people. Uh, I think that makes it that much harder to figure out. If you got mortared with an oily rain and it smelled like garlic, somebody in the military is going to go. I think this rings a bell, uh, but that's not how these exposures are happening. Exactly. Hitting on training real quick, if I can throw it in, is, is I saw somebody to uh, the, this document, you know, expect the unexpected. And I think that's huge is, is John brought it up also, is, is we're doing chem bio training. So everybody's in the chem bio mindset. I think one of the best things you can do for, for almost any training, regardless of, of that discipline from medical to rescue or whatever, is engineer those scenarios to try and actively find gaps in your team. Um, and when you find those gaps, you find something that you suck at, you should embrace that because you found it in training and not in, in a real life event. And you can actually start moving forward to fill that gap and, and become uh, more anti-fragile, be, become better. Um, you know, as an example, you know, we teach firefighters and we teach law enforcement to do these emergency bailouts. Um, and we do that under the premise of we're going to learn how to do emergency bailouts and train on them. instead of having a scenario where you just call 
the 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 whatever that that terminology is over the radio uh, for everybody to get the hell out of that building, regardless of what floor you're on, uh, and time it and see how well you, you get you know your team of six, your team of eight, whatever out uh, and on the ground uh, in safety. And I think you'll be astonished at how poor we really are at it. And in reality, what is the best time? You'll never have the best time. You're always going to be working at shaving more and more in quicker time out. Uh, from the time that that IED is found, you know, um, and we see that, right? We see ones that haven't gone off in the IRC building in, in San Bernardino. Uh, if that was on a multi-story and they were able to recognize that backpack uh, that had literally the exact bomb that AQ uh, put in their, their uh, documents, uh, how fast can you get out of that? Uh, but train for it, uh, yeah, know the technique to do it, but be able to engineer your scenarios to where you put in something that just sucker punches them, just to see how they adapt, to keep them to where they're always seeking something novel and they don't have blinders on going, that's probably not what I think it is, those wires coming out of that backpack or, or you know, that fluid that's coming over here or whatever that is. But uh, regardless of that training, we should always build in sucker punches uh, to do that and see how it goes. And you may not have the right equipment, but see how well your people can think through that problem, even if they have to improvise solutions to get through and get out alive and save people. Uh, I just think that a lot of times we do this training to where we set people up and we train them like uh, we're training canines where they have to have success. They got to find the drugs. They got to find the bomb. And, uh, and then, you know, and then we pat them on the ass and we're like, hey, great day of training. Um, when in reality, we do ourselves a great disservice by not showing areas that, that we are, are marginal at best at. Right, right. All right, so uh, with that, uh, I think we're only a few minutes over, which is pretty impressive for uh, any of us doing this. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, again, we'll get this edited up make it look pretty, prettier than we already look. And then uh, we'll get it posted on the Crisis Medicine website and wherever these two uh, dudes want to have it posted as well. So it'll be available for people to see. Again, uh, thanks, Sean, for insightful commentary. And thanks, John, for basically all you did for these casualties. I work in a really busy emergency department. Uh, I'm used to a pretty crushing volume often of sick people. Uh, I'm glad I have not had the experience you had. That is a soul crushing, demoralizing number of casualties with limited resources that very few people in the world have probably had that experience. Yeah, I, honestly, like I, it's weird, I, I know, but I just feel like I was blessed in it. I, it was just a, another fun Tuesday, um, you know, just having to be the right place to um, so I appreciate it, but yeah, it was, it was a great learning experience for me. And I think that's why I really cared is like, sure. I got some exposure and, and there's some things that went wrong, there's some things that went right. But like, I learned so much from that. And I thought at that stage, you know, it's what, like 17 years into my career, I thought I had learned a decent amount mm -hmm. and to be able to be humbled back to go and, okay, I'm now 23 year old John, I think is a great it, opportunity to kind of grow and, and learn. So. And, um, and again, the reason that I was really happy that we could help get this word out is, you know, I learned a lot of time, long time ago in my SF career that all lessons are learned in blood. And you shed a little blood over this personally with your exposure and the difficulties of a sense that maybe you didn't optimally treat some of these casualties. Um, and we need to learn from those experiences because anyone who saw this presentation is a million times likely, more likely to spot these casualties today than they were yesterday exactly and even if it's not this casualty like hopefully like whatever flip-flops they find themselves in right like then they're just thinking in a different way and, and being able to adjust to it so all yeah, right we'll agree. with that uh i think we'll uh we'll call it a wrap thank you everyone for your time uh and again we'll let everybody know when this is out if anyone anybody wants to re-watch it or pass it on to your friends <laughs>